Thank you for joining me today for a few moments in God's Word. We're going to be looking at the Gospel of John, chapter 21, and our uh, study today involves the thought of camping, being outdoors, uh, spending time with uh, people that you love and care about, uh, and the story tells us uh, in John 21 that they were there at a campfire and of having a meal of fish by the sea. That picture is quite an enjoyable thought as you visualize it in your mind. And if you like camping and the outdoors and uh, being out there and busy and enjoying the uh, open air and uh, uh, all that comes with camping, uh, I don't know about everyone, but uh, when I've done that, uh, it's like I feel far more hungry than normal, and the food always seems to taste better than normal, and it, it's quite an enjoyable time. But nevertheless, let's begin a journey, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 21, and this follows uh, on from earlier post-resurrection appearances of Jesus that are mentioned in John 20. And uh, uh, Thomas has been convinced, and there were other signs which John talks about uh, that are uh, in his story that he's sharing, and many that are not talked about that were a part of what was taking place. Perhaps this was a time uh, for the disciples to stop sitting around in Jerusalem and uh, make their way to Galilee as Jesus had encouraged them to do uh, through the women there in Mark chapter 16, verse 7. And if you look at uh, the 21st chapter, beginning with verse 2 and 3, uh, it's this may or may not be an account for uh, talking about a fishing, fishing expedition. Maybe it's just active men uh, that need to spend some energy uh, and they don't want to be idle so they go and they are fishing. Either way, uh, they're led by Peter, there's seven of them including Thomas, and they make their way back to the Sea of Tiberias. And in verse 4 through 6, they caught nothing all night long they had fished. And in the morning they see a stranger there standing on the shore and ask if they had any fish. And uh, uh, he, he was appearing to desire to buy some from them if they had caught some. Uh, strangely, he instructs them, uh, since they had said, no, we haven't caught anything, he instructs them uh, of go back out and cast the net in a specific way on a specific side of their boat and the story goes on that they caught a multitude of fish. Uh, verse 7 and 8, it was John who first recognized who this stranger was. And it was uh, impetuous Peter who dragged uh, on his coat and swam to shore. He, he just, if that's the Lord, I want to be with him. I want to see him. I want to talk to him. And at first, as he's leaving his friends, to struggle with the catch, uh, and then doubling back to help drag the net to shore. Uh, it's as if he wished to make sure that he made the contact with the Lord. And I believe that that's so critical for any one of us who are believers to have that personal time with the Lord. Uh, devotions is so valuable but the intimate conversation, the bearing of your heart and mind and soul, taking time to be alone with the Lord and commune with him uh, is, is the picture that seems to be portrayed as Peter just jumps in the water and heads to the Lord. Uh, dependency, the need for the Lord, the need for contact, the need for not just a memory, but a visualization, and a conversation uh, with Jesus is so critical to all of us as we journey in this life. If you look at uh, uh, 
John chapter 21, verse 9, we see Jesus through a fire of coals. There's a burning fire, and it's kind of burned down to some good coals for cooking. And perhaps Peter was reminded of how he himself had been standing, warming himself by a fire. Uh, and there he was in the high priest's courtyard, watching the proceedings when Jesus was arraigned by the high priest. Uh, it may not have brought back a, uh, a good memory, but maybe a heavy memory, a, a troublesome memory. And how he had turned uh, uh, away from his faith and away from his connectivity to the Lord in his responses. And the Lord had turned and looked at Peter in Luke chapter 22, verse 61. That had to have been an awful night for Peter, but this is much different. That is in the past, and here he is, and John says, that's the Lord that's standing on the shore. And Peter, boom, jumps in the water and heads to spend some time with the Lord. Verse 10, Jesus, of course, did not need for them to catch fish for him. He'd already caught fish. And, and the story goes that they were prepared and they could come and eat. Uh, but the Lord graciously uh, teaches them, uh, so important to listen for uh, discernment and direction in our lives. And when Jesus was speaking, uh, though they had labored there in the Sea of Tiberias all night long and caught nothing, Jesus speaks to them and he says, go out and cast your net on the other side. And they brought in a draught of fishes that uh, were far more than they could get into the boat. And uh, when we think of the Lord and the wisdom that he can give us, the knowledge that he has, the understanding, and learning to listen for that still small voice of the Lord in our journey of life, in times where we feel uh, helpless, where we feel like we're inadequate, we feel like things are not going in a way that is profitable or beneficial, and we become discouraged and uh, feel very defeated and despondent in our hearts and minds. It's in those times that we need to look for Jesus. The scripture teaches us that he never leaves us alone. He is always with us, and uh, uh, whether we see him with our eyes or we have to envision him by faith, his presence through the Holy Spirit is always available to anyone who turns their heart toward him and in faith calls upon his name. Um, John remembers pain, painstakingly of what's going on and he counts there was 153 fish they caught in the net and yet the net was not broken. And Jesus invites them to come on over to the fire that he's built and to the fish that he's cooked and says, come and dine with me. In meantime, not one of them who doubted the identity of the Lord, the fact that he who was crucified is risen and here he is sitting on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias, having built a fire and cooked fish and ready to feed and fellowship. What a wonderful picture that puts in our heart and our mind that the Lord prepares a table for us and he prepares food for us and, and he's going to stay for, for the time of fellowship. That's so important. Jesus invites them to come and sit with him there on the shore. And Jesus blessed the bread and the fish. And it kind of reminds us of the two stories of the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. The blessing of the Lord also reminds us of the sacrament, uh, the bread that is broken and the blood that was spilt in the cup, that this is the New Testament in the blood and the body of the Lord Jesus, that he became our sacrifice and our Savior. Uh, if you look at verse 14, John points out that this is the third appearance of Jesus to his disciples after his resurrection. The first had been on Easter evening and the second the following Sunday. And here he is there on the Sea of Tiberias having 
cook some fish on an open fire and beckoned his disciples to come by the campfire and spend some time communing and fellowshipping with him. He appears, it's on a working day of the week, and the disciples were busy uh, having the absence of the Lord to lead them and guide them and, and show them ministry. Here they are uh, having to fend for themselves, so they returned to a trade they were familiar with. Having caught nothing all night, the Lord says, I still can speak into your life, and I can still give you wisdom and discernment and knowledge. If you throw the net on the other side and they pull it in and, oh, thank you, Lord, for the times that you speak to us through your word and through other people and through the Holy Spirit. What an awesome uh, opportunity it is anytime the Lord draws near. And he says in scripture, come unto me, ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's kind of like uh, we need a vacation. All right. The Lord's going to take time. He built the campfire, caught the fish, cooked them. And he says, come, come unto me. I can see your weariness. I can see your despondency. I can see your emptiness. And I'm here to be an encouragement and a source of blessing. So we look at uh, <clears throat> verse 15. The conversation between Jesus and Peter was a reaffirmation of the fact that the apostles' business was no longer to be about fish, but about ministry, about pastoral work, about answering the call of God. They were kind of slipping back into who they were before Jesus had called them. And the Lord said, I want you to realize that the time you spent with me during these last three years is not a time that I want you to feel like is lost. But because I am with the Father and interceding for you and the Holy Spirit has come, I'm still going to be with you. I can still speak into your life and I can still give you encouragement, wisdom, direction, discernment, and power to be able to have what you need and do what I've called you to do. Uh, it's a gracious restoration of a relationship that was very intimate while Jesus was alive and with them. But now that he had ascended to the Father and they were walking without his physical presence, he wanted to remind them that through the Spirit, the Comforter, I am still here with you. Uh, verse 15 and 16, uh, in the first two times as we look at Jesus appearing Easter and then Sunday uh, following his crucifixion, uh, those two times of asking Jesus inquired whether Peter who he called Simon, son of Jonas, uh, when he talked to him at that time. And, and he asked him, do you have agape love for me? Uh, that same kind of love which God uh, displays toward us. Do you have the same love, that same kind, type, measure of love that God has toward you? Do you have that toward God? And uh, what, what a time of awakening awareness. Where is your heart? Where is your faith? Where is your connectivity to what I've taught and to what I've called you to do? Uh, this question of love is only attainable through God and through spending time with the Lord. Uh, through time of intercession, sometimes even fasting, waiting on God, being patient in his presence. Uh, and the picture is so important to grasp the importance of the campfire and the fish prepared, the food prepared for them. And Jesus saying, come on, guys, uh, stop your labor, stop worrying, stop being so overwhelmed, uh, withdraw from all that and come and remember how valuable and how important it is to spend time with me. And he will always prepare a table and he will provide the food that is needed and uh, it'll taste better than a campfire and fresh fish caught, I guarantee you, when you spend time with the Lord. 
This kind of relationship produces the agape love, the intimacy, the connectivity that every believer needs. This kind of love that God, uh, that loves God with your mind, your soul, your heart, your strength completely. Nothing withheld. You're just totally in, committed to the Lord. And uh, both of these questions were answered with a different word of love when the Lord was asking him, do you love me? Do you love me? Then he feed my sheep, feed my lamb, feed my sheep. Uh, both of them are answered. And Peter would only admit that he had attained the kind of love that one might have for a friend. And he needed that next level. He needed that intimacy that the Lord says to us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will be with you always. So it is so important to grasp that in our heart. It's part of the marriage vow that no matter what happenings, we're committed, we're, we're in, and uh, we're not going to consider not being committed. Our heart is there and it's given completely. And uh, the Lord is asking, do you have that kind of love for me, Peter? Are you going to stick with this? Uh, are you going to lose your way? And it's so important that we grasp that uh, in the message of John 21. Jesus brought the question down to Peter's level and we can almost sense uh, Peter's frustration. Uh, are you sure? Uh, <laughs> are you sure that you have at least this kind of love for God today? as a believer? That's an important question. Uh, Jesus is drawing, drawing focus in the story of him and his disciples, but here we are in 2023, uh, beginning now the month of, month of March, and uh, where is our love for God? Where's our vow? Where's our commitment? Have things started to become so heavy that we feel we're being drawn away or pushed away or we feel lost or overwhelmed by all that is happening? Uh, I feel that way sometimes. But oh, when you call upon the name of the Lord in faith, there he is. You may be in a different part of the world and not on the Sea of Tiberias on the shore, but wherever you are, the Lord's calling and saying, come on, I've got a campfire built and I've got some food ready. Most importantly, I'm here. And if you come, you and I will be together. You can't get better than that. You couldn't buy it. You couldn't make it happen. But when he calls us, oh, what a wonderful reward we have. Uh, no more fishing, Peter. After the three years that he'd spent with the Lord on the road, walking and going and going and going, the time has come for the fisherman to become a shepherd, a shepherd of souls, a fisherman of men. And uh, the Lord wants to refocus their attention, not let them fall back into the malaise of just being men who went out to uh, catch fish to provide their food and their living. But remember to trust God, follow the Holy Spirit, and God will supply your need. Uh, Jesus signified by what Peter means would die and glorified God. Then he said, follow me, follow me. Cannot minister to others without the Lord. That's first thing. And we cannot minister to others if we're so tied up doing something else other than ministry. And the Lord's trying to refocus, especially Peter and the disciples' attention. Verse 20 and 21, uh, at this point, they arose from the meal and Peter looked around and saw John following. Seems as though Peter was already distracted even after this intimate time of the Lord showing up and feeding them and fellowshipping. He, he was just probably trying to digest what was taking place and part of his heart was yearning for the Lord to be back with them. The other part was overwhelmed with the thought of how am I going to make it? How am I going to live? How am I going to eat? 
How am I going to do the things that I need to do? And the Lord's saying, I'm still here. I'm still going to lead you. Follow me. And as he looked, John was already up on his feet following the Lord. Uh, the answer was uh, hypothetical. If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to you? Jesus says to Peter. <laughs> Jesus was not saying that he expected to return before John died. Uh, the imperative, you follow me, was in effect, mind your own business, Peter. Don't be trying to figure everybody else's problems and and what they're going to do. You focus on what I've called you to do. If you follow me, I will make a way. I will lead you in the path. I will supply your needs and I will be with you. Don't worry about what others are doing. You focus on what I have for you to do. And in verse 23, the writer of the gospel, Apostle John was at pains trying to debunk a tradition that had risen in the early church. The rumor had spread that John was not going to die, but Jesus did not say that, argues John. Uh, and Peter was concerned he'd lost Jesus and now he's concerned, is John really going to die? And the Lord's saying, that's nothing for you to worry about. <laughs> Boy, when you've got a close companion and Jesus is gone and you're covering your, your source of life and joy and peace and strength and everything has been crucified and then he rises from the dead and ascends to heaven and now the Lord, uh, people were talking about John dying. Peter was beside himself. And the Lord says, you need to calm down and focus on me. Keep your eyes on Jesus, my friend. Don't allow what's happening to others. Change your vow, your commitment, your devotion, and your connectivity to the Lord Jesus. You keep your heart where it belongs not tied to people and mankind and family and relatives and spouses and children. That's important, but don't let it be your motivator or the lack of motivation if something was to happen. Let the Lord be your all in all. Love him with all your mind, your soul, your heart, your strength, and keep your focus upon him. In verse 24 of the 21st chapter, uh, the disciples whom Jesus and Peter were discussing in this last scene of the uh, chapter of the gospel is identified as the writer of the gospel, and that's John. And John speaks in the first person. He says, we know. And much as he does in 1 John 1, 3, he says, that which we have seen and heard. Uh, what a wonderful reaffirmation of who Jesus was, what he had done, what he was still going to do here on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias. And there were so many other things. The Bible tells us that the story doesn't contain the whole of what happened. I'm sure there's more conversation and more detail and, and more of everything. But it, it gives to us the importance of remembering that once the Lord has redeemed us, saved us, and come to live in our heart, that no matter what happens, he is with us. And no matter what's going on in the world, he can set a table before us, even if it's on the shore of a pond or a sea or a stream, and he can build the fire and he can cook the fish and he can supply your every need. Most importantly, he's not going to leave you. He's going to be with you. And uh, we need to be encouraged by that. The statement in the final verse of the book assures that to use these words of Queen Sheba in 1 Kings 10, verse 7, the half was not told us. I can only imagine the feeling of the disciples that on that evening where they had worked all night, exhausted, hungry, wondering how they were going to be able to make it. And Jesus shows up to remind them of who he is, what he can do, and what he's going to do, and also remind us of what he's called us to do. 
Let's keep that in mind in our days and nights, no matter what's going on, we know Jesus is with us. He will see you through, my friend. Be encouraged today. May God richly bless you. Have a wonderful rest of your day.